Alki Murray here for New York Talk NYC, and again we got the hot mic. I oh, apologize for the background noise, but I think I picked the windiest day of the year to do this history lesson. Anyway, this history lesson is going to be all about probably one of the most controversial figures in history, bar none, Robert Moses. Robert Moses built most of our bridges, tunnels, beaches, parks, roads, and highways. In fact, every foot of every highway in all North America links right back to Robert Moses. Robert Moses also did something that Mother Nature couldn't do since the beginning of time, and that was to unify three of our boroughs with his Tri-Borough Bridge. Robert Moses did a whole bunch of other stuff that we just don't have time to cover. But the other side of all this is that Robert Moses was easily the most despotic autocrat the city had. So Robert Moses held the city as merciless grip for nearly half a century with unlimited power, resources, and money to do just about anything he wanted and did just about anything he wanted. And this is something that will never happen again. <laughs> but it happened. And that's what we're gonna talk about today in this history lesson. We're gonna get into all of this. And I want you guys to participate. We've got a comment section below. I want you guys to hit us. Hit us hard. It would be so much fun to do a follow-up episode and include your comments on this. So when we get back, it'll be Robert Moses, <laughs> the guy who still loves people who are 40 years after he was dead. starts Robert Moses back in 1888 and ironically this is the same year that the automobiles were invented and around the same time the middle class is it's in its infancy now and Robert Moses would spend most of his adult life weaving these things together and creating something that we call today urban sprawl or the race to flee out to the suburbs <laughs> and Robert Moses graduates Yale University so the swim team passionate lifelong swimmer and Olympic caliber swimmer too He'd go over to England, after going to Oxford, he'd come back, he'd go to New York City's Columbia University, graduate there, and land his first job with the then governor of New York, Al Smith. Al Smith is immediately impressed with Robert Moses. Guys like this, of this formal education, do not go into public service. They go into the private sector. He also sees that Robert Moses is kind of everything Al Smith is not. Al Smith was born in a saloon in New York City from immigrant parents from Ireland. Didn't even graduate high school. He was elected by Tammany Hall. Basically, you know, there was no middle class. Uh, one of the few things in between the few haves and the many, many have-nots were this political machine called Tammany Hall, which was largely Irish, largely Catholic, and wholly democratic. They were kind of the, the answer to the Protestant money that was really controlling the city. For 150 years, they were pretty efficient, for the most part. Uh, but now things are changing. Now there's a middle class simmering at the surface here. And things are going to start to change pretty quick. So, Al Smith is a part of Tammany Hall. He's the governor of New York. They now, Robert Moses writes a bill. The first bill he writes expands the governor's term from two years to four. And this rubs Tammany Hall the wrong way. They like to run the elections. They like to appoint the judges, the commissioners. They like to do all that kind of stuff. And now Al Smith uh, might have stepped over the line a little bit. But he knew, his, he knew his limits and he knew what he can get away with. And this is one of the instances. So, they kind of turned the blind eye to what he did. Moses takes on the job as Parks Commissioner. Al Smith also makes him Secretary of the State of New York, not the country. But the next bill Robert Moses writes takes almost 200 city agencies or jobs and he pairs them down to 18. This sets Tammany Hall on fire. These were jobs that Tammany Hall would use to dole out to their constituents so they could get favors returned to them. And now like 80% of them are gone because of Robert Moses. And so Al Smith now has to take Moses out of New York City. So he puts him on Long Island. And Moses draws these really ambitious plans on how he's going to form Long Island. And the first thing he wants to do, of course, being the swimmer, is he wants to build beaches. Miles and miles and miles of beaches on Long Island that are virtually empty. At the time, Long Island was one big strip of island with one road down the middle. It was often mired with traffic, commercial traffic, trucks doing deliveries, a lot of farms. There's always somebody getting stuck. He thought it would be so much easier if we could build a separate road for people that own cars and a separate road for the commercial. So he draws up these ambitious plans. Governor Smith gives a really, really nasty comment. And he says, Moses, you know, you're offering the people fur coats. So all they really want is underwear. So this sets Moses off, of course. Around the same time, an interesting character crosses the paths of Al Smith. His name is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He's the former Secretary of the Navy. So Al Smith realizes the power that Franklin Roosevelt brings. I mean, he's from an established family of politicians, Republican largely. Theodore Roosevelt, his granduncle, was once the president. He turned Democrat 
Al Smith makes him the Park Commissioner as well. He has to keep Franklin Roosevelt out of Tammany Hall's way too because he doesn't like Tammany Hall. Roosevelt's from an establishment and Tammany Hall is the opposite of that. He has Al Smith doing his juggling. He's got a full plate. He's got Roosevelt upstate. He's got Moses on Long Island. He's got Tammany Hall in the city and he wants to be the President of the United States of America and he has all his things lining up. Not to mention, they're going to build the biggest building in the world, the Empire State Building, which Al Smith thinks is a dedication to his legacy. <laughs> so he got his hands full with this, and he gives Roosevelt the nod to run for governor while he runs for president, and this sets Robert Moses off again. So the 1920 election comes around, Al Smith loses the presidency, so he goes off to the private sector and builds his Empire State Building. Roosevelt becomes the governor, so now Moses' rival becomes his, his boss, so to speak. Roosevelt wants to dig on Moses, but Moses, of all the commissioners, is the only one working. Moses learns early on that smaller jobs beget bigger jobs. He's not interested at all in money. He's interested in power. He seems to find a way to negotiate money for power. He'll take on these jobs, he shows his efficiency, and he wants power in return. He starts to gobble up little chair positions, they lead to commissioner positions. And slowly but surely, he's building a little power base for himself. Pretty much goes under the radar from just about everybody. And then all of a sudden, the depression hits. And everybody starts going crazy. Roosevelt realizes he has to save the world. As the governor of New York, he runs for the presidency in the next election. Moses takes it upon himself to run for governor. And he runs against a guy named Lehman, who slaughters him. Lehman becomes the governor. Roosevelt becomes the president. And Moses learns another very valuable lessons about power. And pretty much, if you want power, you're just going to have to go take it. And that's just what he does. Robert Moses was just intellectually superior to anybody in any room he was in. He did a lot of calculations in his head on multiple projects at the same time. He just was able to hold these numbers without any computers, without any calculators, without any advancements of technology that we have today. There was no Google, there was no internet, there was no drones, there was no cell phone cameras, there was no way to smartphone anything. It was all hard work and what he did. And surveying the city and the land for built his roads and bridges and tunnels and beaches and parks and highways and stadiums and all that. It's all the information he was able to store in his head all at the same time. Multiple, large, multi-billion dollar projects. Just supremely efficient at any job that he did. And he proved it time and time again. Of course, the dark side of all this is Robert Moses was not a nice guy. He hated people, but he was in love with his projects. Moses built and ran two world's fairs. The one during the Depression... They actually made money. Got the whole world to come to New York City in a depression and spend money here and make it a profit. First one is where he displayed what he was going to do with his roadways. And he was smart enough to put his pavilion right between forts and firestones. And here's Robert Moses right in the middle with his diorama on how he's showing this 3D cutout on how he's going to change the world with his highway system. And of course, his parkways and what's going to keep the two of them separate and why it's important to keep commercial traffic and a nice flow for people with personal cars on another road altogether. So his World's Fair would lead to his you know, development of these roads. He wanted to build his parkways on Long Island to get the people to the beaches that he wanted to build. And the people on Long Island, the, you know, the rich people that lived on the Gold Coast, and if you read any of those F. Scott Fitzgerald novels, these people lived in these opulent mansions. These were the abs. And these were railroad tycoons. These were you know, shipping magnates. These were uh, bankers. And they lived in these opulent mansions that were, you know, 30, 40, 50, 80,000 square feet in houses. Some of these houses were converted to museums. It's how big they were. And they didn't want these rubes from the city coming out and living on their pristine island. But Robert Moses had a plan. He says, look, they're not going to live where you are. We're going to put them out east near the beaches. I'm building these beaches up and these resorts. We just got to get the people there in their car. So we're going to build a parkway through your area. There'll be no exits where they can get off. There'll be no shoulders where they can pull over and gawk. We're going to have landscape tall trees to block everything so they don't see nothing. All they want to do is go through in their cars. There'll be no commercial traffic. Now, his expressways was a whole other thing. Now, Robert Moses, like I said, wanted to put an expressway on top of Manhattan. And this would facilitate the shipping industry. Now, before the 747, the way shipping worked is ships would come in from other countries and dock in New York mostly. From there, they would unload their goods, longshoremen would put them on the back of trains or trucks, and these trucks would have to drive through the city, stopping at all the traffic lights. Some of those neighborhoods are not so nice. What happens to those trucks when they stop at lights at night in those not-so-good neighborhoods? They often leave a little bit lighter 
the shipping magnates would just consider this the cost of business. But Robert Moses had a plan. He's going to change all this with his expressways. He's going to have an expressway over the top of Manhattan with ramps going down to the shipping lanes. So the longshoremen can load the trucks. The trucks go right up a ramp and onto an expressway and right through the city and out to wherever they got to go. They don't have to stop at any lights or any neighborhoods. The one thing that gave Robert Moses most of his power was his work on the Tribar Bridge. Because up until this point, anytime somebody didn't like what Moses was doing, they were happy to just defund his project. And this drove Moses crazy. But Moses found a way around that with his Tribar Bridge. Now you have to understand, they've been trying to build the Tribar Bridge for over 20 years now. How many whole bosses figured out it was far more lucrative for them if they don't build this bridge? Just keep coming up with excuses why it can't be built and then building the city for it and then kicking the money up to Tammany Hall. So that was a very lucrative stream of income from Tammany Hall bosses for over, over, over two decades. But now we have a new mayor. His name is Fiorio LaGuardia. The 99th mayor of New York City beat a Tammany Hall candidate to win the mayor's election. So now, for the first time in 150 years, Tammany Hall is without a governor or without a mayor in an elected position. And... I'm not going to say half, but a lot of their constituents have already begun to move out of the city. So they lost a lot of their voting base. So not as powerful as they used to be. LaGuardia sees this. The problem LaGuardia has now is that the only person competent that can build the bridge in New York City efficiently is Robert Moses. So the two of these guys have a meeting, and this meeting goes absolutely crazy. You got two of the biggest egos in New York City going at it. Neither one has the back down gene. Robert Moses will not touch this bridge with a 10-foot pole unless he is supremely in charge of everything. He wants to be the Triborough Bridge Commissioner. And LaGuardia is reluctant because he knows there's a toll involved and Moses will be in charge of those funds if he gives Moses his way. But he really has no choice. He has Tammany on the ropes bleeding. So he gets the best experts he can find and... There's no way they could predict how much money he's going to make. But they tell him $2 million a year, maybe five. So he has to weigh this out. How much damage could Robert Moses do with a 2 to $5 million budget every year, plus all the other power that he has? Is it worth getting ready to have him? And the answer is yes. Once he commits to having Robert Moses build this bridge, he marches right into the tribal authority he fires every one of those Tammany Hall candidates. Not only that, he breaks them up on charges. These are Tammany Hall's best guys. Their best chiefs are now all being indicted. So that Tammany Hall is in a whirlwind right now. It's a big game of thrones over there. Everybody's cutting each other's throats. And Robert Moses takes over and builds the Triborough Bridge. 18 months later, Robert Moses cuts the ribbon on the Triborough Bridge. For t over 20 years, the Tammany bosses were in charge of this bridge. They had one hole dug 10 feet wide. Robert Moses, 18 months, it's open. <laughs> oh, how much money does it make? The first year it was open, $25 million. <laughs> Moses created a little piggy bank for himself. So he builds, what does he do now? He builds the Whitestone Bridge. He builds the Throgneck Bridge. He builds the Giovanni de Veros and Alice Bridge. Moses builds 13 bridges in New York City, all of them with tolls, all kicking back money to the tribal authority, which he is supremely in charge in. And now Moses has virtually an unlimited budget to do whatever he wants for the next 30, 40 years. And nobody could stop him. Well, if Moses was appointed, why couldn't they just fire Robert Moses? <laughs> Hang on, tough guy. As anybody who owns a business will tell you, before you fire one of your best officers, you better make sure that you got somebody as good or better in their position. In the case of Robert Moses, who do we have? Robert Moses stood in an ocean of people who were wholly incompetent, had very little education, no business being that job, got that job because of some personal favor from Tammany Hall or somebody else. And here's Moses, cracking away, working. Moses is also smart enough to stagger his jobs, he had scores of jobs going on all at the same time. Thousands of people at work with different completion dates all set up, and he met his completion dates pretty much. Very efficient taskmaster, and he was pretty rough on these people. But his jobs got done. Now remember, before television, this is the way politicians would thump. As men as they would get at Robert Moses, they knew they would just 
a week or two away from one of his ribbon cutting things, where they get to put on their best suits and come out and, and show their constituents of something that's getting done, something that's finished in the city, and they get to, you know, campaign for the next election. And Robert Moses provided this opportunity time and time and time again. They threatened to fire Moses. He was pretty smart and snarky at the same time. He typed up his letter of resignation. He handed it to the mayor. He handed it to the governor. He says, look, you want to fire me? Go ahead. Fire me. But I walk away from not just this job, all of them. Every commission level, every chair position I have, every job I'm working. In fact, anything with my name on it goes with me. That would have been an unmitigated disaster in the city because there's nothing that public hates more than seeing half-done projects laying around the city. It reflects so poorly on the incompetency of the people in charge, i.e. the politicians. You know, when you're not a likable guy, you tend to get the blame for stuff. And some of the stuff is warranted, but some of it isn't. One of the things that Robert Moses tends to get the blame for is the Dodgers leaving, going to Los Angeles. you got to know your history, and now you're talking to a baseball guy. Now, in 1958, that's when the Dodgers left town. The owner was a guy named Walter O'Malley. Where the Dodgers played in Ebbets Field, it was an antiquated stadium. It was falling apart. But most people have cars now, and there's no place to park. Besides, the field is surrounded four sides by the busy streets of downtown Brooklyn, so they can't expand it any bigger for its growing fan base. Walter O'Malley goes over to Robert Moses, and he asks Moses if he can build him a stadium, and he likes the spot over there where the, where the Barclay Center is today. But Moses wants to use that for something else. He says, look, I'll build you a stadium. It's got to be Brooklyn, though. I'm going to put it up in Queens, where my next World's Fair is going to be. Now, another thing I should tell you is that up until this point, 1958, there wasn't one stadium in America that was turning a profit. They were all operating at a loss. The cities took them on as a burden because the people wanted them for their entertainment. But nobody was showing any profit. Robert Moses promised that the stadium he builds will show no profit. Walter O'Malley was in talks with the mayor of Los Angeles. I can't think of his name right now. Uh, but he gave O'Malley a deal he couldn't refuse. He says, I will build you a stadium in downtown Los Angeles, free, for the first five years. You get 100% of everything, the gate, the parking, the concessions, every dime that goes into that stadium, you get 100% of it for the first couple of years if you move your team out here. So, as an offer, he really can't refuse. The only trick that he has to pull off now is baseball says he has to bring another team out there with him. You can't just do things alone. you got to have at least one other team to come out there with you. So Walter O'Malley runs up to Harlem where his arch rivals, the Giants, play. And he knows the Giants are imploding. The Giants are fed up with living in the shadow of the Yankees and the Dodgers. So they want to leave town. They want to go to Minnesota where their farm team is. O'Malley is able to convince them to go over to California. He says, look, you take San Francisco, we'll take Los Angeles. We'll be each other's rivals and we'll leave New York to the damn Yankees. Well, like I said, the Giants get the short end of the deal. I don't get too much into it. This is not really a baseball story, but... Some of the Giants' owners stay behind, simmering. So Mayor Wagner of New York City comes busting in. He's banging his fist on the desk. He goes, you know, we just lost our National League Baseball teams. we got to get a National League Baseball team right away. If we don't do it now, all the New Yorkers will go over to become Yankee fans, and we'll never get them back. So we got to do this, and we got to do it right now. So now that Tammany Hall is gone, the undercurrent of power that's been running New York City is actually these four very powerful attorneys. All of them happen to be Irish, and all of them happen to be Catholic. They call these guys the bishops. Now, of the four, Bill Shea is probably the most powerful, but they're all very powerful. Bill Shea, he's a hometown guy. He's from Washington Heights, bulldog of a street fighter. You know, somebody along the way probably convinced him to turn his life around. He graduated NYU, scholarship to Georgetown, came back and became one of the most high-profile lawyers in New York City. Also, like the other three lawyers, they're very quiet. There's not really a lot of books written on these guys because they know how to keep their mouth shut and they were very comfortable running the undercurrent of the city. Um, it's a shame that some of the best stories and secrets went to the graves with them. Unlike today, these lawyers can't wait to get out there and you know, tell old books and everything. It'd be wonderful to have dinner with some of these guys when you get to heaven. You know, that's where they are. So anyway, they form this new team. The Giants owners step up. That They bring over the old Giants logo. They change the colors a little bit. The team is the Metropolitans. We call them the Mets for short. Uh, but baseball tells them the same thing. you got to do it in pairs. You need another team. So they go out and they, they ask a bunch of cities. And the city of Houston, Texas, steps up. They come up with their Colt 45s. And next year, I think it becomes the Astros. I think it's the next year. <laughs> Six or seven years, the Mets win the World Series. <laughs> you, can't, you can't write the story any better. Uh, and and uh, 
So here it is, Robert Moses gets all the blame for the Dodgers leaving Brooklyn, but none of the credit for the Mets, you know, winning. He builds a stadium, he provides the financing, and he, he turns a profit on his stadium. He's the only stadium in the league at the time that was actually making a profit. So we talked about a lot of the controversy that Robert Moses brought. Well, you know, even amongst our crew here, we had some pretty hellacious arguments. There's one of them, he destroyed neighborhoods. Yes, Moses destroyed neighborhoods. He had to. He had to build bridges. He had to build parkways that lead up to him, and they were in the right location. And he had a pretty good answer to this. Robert Moses said, you called these places slums before I wanted to build something. And now, all of a sudden, they're neighborhoods. Moses, don't forget, was also the commissioner of the housing authority. Robert Moses built over 150,000 housing units for low-income tenants. And he put those all over the city. These people that were living in what they called slums, they were city housing. If the city found the need to move it, they had to move it. They needed something that was efficient there, so they moved the people. What about the farms in Long Island that were forced out? Those people owned those farms. They weren't renting. They owned them. And they were forced out by eminent domain. It wasn't racial. They wanted to build highways. They wanted to build shopping centers. They wanted to build housing developments. They wanted to... The middle class was coming. But, you know, the fur flies when you bring up this kind of stuff. And this is where the passion of the debate comes. Also, his parkways. Here's another one. Drives us crazy. The parkways Robert Moses built had an overpass with only a 12-foot clearance. Because he didn't want city buses to go to the beaches on Long Island. Wow. <laughs> this is this is quite a stretch. All right, now, first of all, there's beaches in New York City. You can get on a subway and go to Coney Island anytime you want. Rockaway Beach, you can go anytime you want. If you want, you can get on a railroad and go out to Long Beach, Long Island. The, the Long Island Railroad pulls right up to a beach on Long Island. Um, Robert Moses built those parkways for cars. If you want to take a bus from the city to go to the beach, hey, you don't want this expressway two miles up the road, go in the same direction, have at it. But why? Why would anyone jump on a bus in New York City to go beach on Long Island and sit in two, two and a half hours of traffic when you can just get on a subway for 20 minutes and be in Coney Island or the Rockaways? Really? is You know, I mean, come on. Robert Moses built those overpasses with a 12 foot clearance for a couple of reasons. One, his engineers told him that if you make them even two feet higher, you're going to double the price. Now, Robert Moses built these roads during the Depression where he had a count for every dollar and every penny and to where it went. He built over 460 miles of parkways, and that adds up to after a while. He built them for automobiles. He knew that if you didn't put some sort of physical boundary over there, if you ever got whacked or fired or removed from his position in some way or whatever, they would just turn it turn what he wanted to do around if he didn't put some physical barrier there. And his second World's Fair, not as popular as the first one, promoted Lee I. Coker's Ford Mustang 1964 and a instant American icon and would launch the, the whole muscle car revolution. But a convertible, the top down, zipping down the parkway with your hair blowing in the wind, going to the beach. This is how Robert Moses sold more cars than Ford. And this Ford made more babies in America than anything else possible. In 1964, we entered the baby boom. It took the work of two billionaire brothers to finally take him down. The Rockefeller brothers. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller is governor of New York, and his brother Davis and Rockefeller was the owner of Chase Manhattan Bank, who wrote the bonds for Robert Moses' projects. So these two guys put their heads together, and they came up with a plan to merge the Metropolitan Transit Authority with his Triborough Commission. They told Moses if he signed off his, over his power, they would make him a consultant. Of course, Moses signs over his power, and they never call him again. So that was the end of Moses. But by this time, Moses is well until his 80s, and he's uh, pretty long in the tooth. And ironically, Robert Moses, who worked himself into jobs his whole entire career, ended up working himself out of a job in the end. Because it got to a point where the city kind of has everything it needs. It has all the stadiums, all the bridges, all the highways. All that stuff was kind of done. There's only the small stuff left. And they don't need Robert Moses for any more heavy lifting besides... His ideas were starting to get a little bit bizarre. He wanted to build bridges over the Long Island Sound. He wanted to merge islands in the lower Hudson Bay, in the middle of nowhere to do, I don't know what, uh, and, and things of that nature. So it was probably time for him to go. Of course, he didn't want to go. He was very bitter in the end. June 29th, 1981, Robert Moses passed away. And his 92 trips around the sun, he outlived most of his contemporaries, and he left quite a legacy behind. It's going to be interesting to see how history looks back at Moses. A good guy, bad guy debate's going to go on. Probably past, well past our lifetime. <laughs> this podcast here, I don't know if it's going to make that much of a difference. But, 
Yeah, look what Moses did. I mean, really. Robert Moses saw slums and converted them to low-income housing. He saw dumping grounds and landfills and he converted them to palatial parks. And most of all, Robert Moses saw the automobile and he built the roads. Thousands and thousands of miles of an interstate highway system all linked together, going back to Robert Moses. He saw the middle class bursting out of the confines of New York City and found a place for him. Like the biblical Moses, who marches people out of Egypt, here comes our Moses and created this urban sprawl for people to go out into the suburbs. Now, could he save everybody? No, of course not. Was he a perfect person? No, he wasn't. And neither was the original Moses, by the way. Robert Moses served 13 jobs at the New York City Commission level, most of them at the same time, yet he only collected one paycheck. He couldn't be bought out. He couldn't be uh, corrupted in any such way. And Moses, in all his wicked ways, shattered the grip that these corrupt political machines had on our do-nothing politicians, and he changed the game. But he didn't always get his way. The story of Jan Jacobs should tell you that. And who was Jan Jacobs but a housewife? But it goes to show you that if you do the work like she did and you put up the fight like she did, you could have stopped Moses. But no, they're lazy. So they'd rather let him have his way and call him names. Yeah, you know, there's a big problem with racism today. It's 2020 and we still have this problem. And it's a problem that's going to take all of us to work together to solve. But when you call everybody a racist, then nobody's a racist. And when nobody's a racist, we end up with stuff like this. And that's a problem. Besides, don't forget Moses was at least half Jewish. If you're going to put yourself in a position to call him a racist, you're making yourself an anti-Semite. And it's sad, but it's true. That every time something goes a little bit wrong in this world, there's always this movement that's trying to look for Jewish people to blame and make them a scapegoat. And that's what people are trying to do with Moses. Well, a lot went wrong in the time Moses was here. I think he was more of a solution than a problem, despite flaunting his powers. Now, was he a little bit arrogant? Of course. Did he overstep his boundaries? Probably. Did he push things a little too far sometimes? Maybe. Nobody's perfect. But to call Moses a racist because you didn't like his arrogance? I don't know. Unless I'm wrong, unless I'm missing something, I have a comment box below. You guys hit me, hit me hard. I love to learn. Moses didn't commit treason. Moses didn't enslave people. And certainly Moses didn't kill anybody. But he's got a statue out in Long Island that some people want to tear down because, again, it's just people looking to hate. Well, here's my opinion. You tear down Robert Moses' statue, but you drive over his bridges and his roads and you go to his parks and his stadiums, then you're just a hypocrite. Hey, that's just my opinion. They got theirs, you have yours. But that's why we love New York Talk. Well, that's it for this History Listen. I'm Malachi Murray, and until next time, read something good, or, like Ben Franklin used to say, do something worth writing about.